You are listening to the Quarter Transmissions Episode 66. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. And that does it for our coverage of Wink of an Eye. That was episode 66 of the Tricorder Transmissions. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're just getting started. This is episode 66 of the Tricorder Transmissions. We are your hosts, Jeff Hewlett. <laughs> and Craig Cohen. <laughs> uh, we got, uh, we got a, a special guest with us for this intro this week. And uh, he is part of our super panel. And that is Mr. Chris Ritzer. It's been a while since he's been on the show. Chris, how are you? Hello, everybody. I've uh, been doing good. Happy New Year to you, sir. Happy, oh, Happy New Year to you, too. Happy Great. New Year to you, Craig. Yes, very, very, uh, very Happy New Year back to you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. And the reason why we brought Chris on is because Chris was recently uh, traveling for the holidays, and he happened to be uh, in proximity of the Mall of Americas. And in the Mall of America, I did not know this, uh, there is a uh, Star Trek exhibit, which I believe is some of the remnants of the Star Trek experience from Las Vegas. Am I am I right on that, Chris? I believe so. I I tried to find out about that. I could not find anything on the internet, but quite possibly. So we we had talked about this offline the other day. Uh, we we had met up for lunch and talked a little bit about this, and you had told me some of the things that you'd seen and sent some pictures. And I've got the pictures are going to be up on the website when this episode launches uh, on Sunday. And uh, so you, you, you told me that you saw the, the timeline, the Star Trek timeline, right? Yes. As soon as you walked into the exhibit, on your left-hand side, there was a, a timeline. Uh, it actually began with, like, the actual space program, NASA and all that. And eventually it got into the Star Trek uh, timeline, starting with uh, Zephyr and Cochran and all that, and ran all the way through the movies. Hmm. Uh, so it was kind of cool to see where things would fall in the timeline and all that. At first, I thought that's all I was going to be in the exhibit because it's pretty much all black all around you. There was like one big shift to your right when you walked in. I think it was from Voyager. I'm not sure. There was also some uh, props there. And I think they these were all uh, replicas. They didn't have any real props up front. Hmm. And at first, I wasn't too impressed. I'm like, oh, this is it. But you walk down a little bit further, you turn around a corner, and they had a ton of stuff. They had uh, a few uh, captain's chairs. I think one was from Next Generation. Another was from uh, one of the mo one of the movies, a Klingon chair. And there was another blue one. I'm not sure what chair that was from. Um, did you happen to see that picture, Jeff? Uh, I have the pictures, but I don't have them handy. Uh, so it's okay. tough to look at. But the, the pictures will be, again, on the website when the, when the episode goes live. So you'll be able to see what it is. And, uh, Craig... Well, what Chris said uh, at the beginning of that, which uh, the, about the timeline, that does sound a heck of a lot like what they had at the Star Trek experience, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They had that whole, yeah, the start of the, what, the History of the Future Museum. Yeah, it was a long walkway that kind of curved around a little bit, and it, it started out from, you know, pretty much the Stone Age, if you will, and went all the way through, uh, I think at the time it went through, what, Voyager, I think, because that was, that was the last series uh, that was... Uh, I, I'm not sure if they updated it for Enterprise or not. I don't remember, but I think yeah. it went all the way up through Voyager. Yeah, I think you're right. So pretty yeah, cool. This, yeah, this timeline did have Enterprise in it. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so it was complete. Yes. Very cool. And you saw a lot of costumes? You sent me pictures of costumes. Yeah, there was a lot of costumes they had there that were actually from uh, the various TV shows and movies. Uh, they had uh, Whoopi, a couple of 
Whoopi Goldberg's costumes, one from, I think it's the episode of Time's Arrow, and then another one when she's working in the bar. They had Picard's uh, Robin Hood costume. Mm -hmm. uh, they had Zephyrin Cochran's uh, costume from the movies. They had quite a few of them. Uh, I think the coolest ones, though, were uh, they had three of Kirk's costumes from the uh, motion picture, uh, Rathacon, and from the original series. Wow. Awesome. That was really cool. They had uh, Khan's costume from the movie. Hmm. They had. Uh, they also had the male and female Pleon costumes from the one episode you guys just did a uh, podcast for. Oh, Day of the Dove? Yes, that one. Very yeah, cool. they had uh, the costumes from that episode. Yeah, they, I was really surprised how many they had. Then from the motion pictures, they also had a... Uh, from the last one, uh, Shinzon from Nemesis. Uh, they had from Enterprise. They had Archers. Uh, they had a really nice selection of them. Very, very cool. And yeah, I'm I'm glad that you just happened to be there at the right time to catch that exhibit. Yes, so was I. So very cool. <laughs> that was not a. It was not expecting to see that there. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to run some of this by uh, April and Vern and and ask them if this is familiar because I remember. Uh, reading that some of the stuff from History of the Future Museum in Vegas had been turned into like a traveling Star Trek exhibit. I yeah, I was looking on, they actually have a website for this exhibit and they don't list it uh, going anywhere else. Right now it's just at Mall of America and mm -hmm. that's it. And uh, they also had uh, the bridge of the original Enterprise. Oh, set. wow. That was really, really cool. And I was looking for the Jettison Pod button, but uh, it was not there. There were a bunch of other buttons, though, so I, it's easy, I think, to get confused and hit the wrong one by accident. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was nice. I able to get a picture taken sitting in the captain's chair. It was actually a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. Hmm. I thought it was going to be a bit cramped, but it was actually a halfway decent size. They also had the uh, sets for uh, engineering from the next generation, and uh, they had some uh, other props as well, some uh, like Klingon weapons, Federation weapons, a little of this, a little of that. Cool. That sounds pretty awesome. Craig, we may have to go out there. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would love that. That's what's one of the biggest malls in the country. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. I've always wanted to check that out. Well, you saw it on the first episode of WCW Monday Night Nitro. Oh, God, that was years ago, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> that was years ago that I used to watch wrestling. But that's a whole nother podcast. Whole nother <laughs> podcast. Uh, you know, crotchety old guys watching wrestling. So maybe we'll do that in a couple of years. But uh, but thank you. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that experience with everybody. And thank you for sending those pictures over. And I'm, I'm looking forward to posting them online. And uh, if anybody else that's, that's listening to the show has been to this exhibit, you know, share your thoughts on it with us we'd love to talk to you about it and you know you can go to the facebook and uh, tricorder transmissions or ttt underscore pod on twitter and and let us know that you've been there and talk to us about it but uh, so chris thank you uh, so much for for being on the show with us oh thanks for having me on again all right and uh, you know what why don't we take a moment here while you're with us to talk uh, to tease the upcoming supplemental that you're going to be a big part of we're going to be doing a klingon yes. based supplemental right Yes, I cannot wait for this one. Yeah, and, and we're going to be recording that, I think, in a couple weeks from now. And uh, I think we have an extremely special guest, uh, aside from Chris, lined up for that one. I'm not going to spoil it yet, but uh, this is going to be a first-timer on the show. And uh, this guy is going to be very, very cool, and he's enthusiastic about coming on. So I'm very happy about this. And uh, this is going to be a fun one, I think. Oh, most certainly. It's always fun to talk Klingons, and I'm going to make sure I drink a lot of blood wine for this one. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you get some of that Klingon beer, whatever that yes. Klingon beer we had at the uh, the convention. But uh, All right, Craig, Cohen, are you ready to jump into our commentary on Wink of an Eye? You know it. All right. So, Wink of an Eye originally aired on November 29th of 1968, and our remaster came on January 13th of 2007. All right. And the Enterprise is hijacked by hyper-accelerated sterile aliens who want the crew for breeding stock. All right. And we will get started. Go ahead and queue up your DVDs, your Blu-rays, your Netflix, your YouTubes, your Vimeos, your Star Trek.coms. We're going to get started in three, 
two, one. And look at that. We have another Class M Earth-like planet. It looks just like the previous planet, but we've got Scotty doing a ship's log as opposed yeah. to a captain's log. And some weirdo guy sitting in Chekhov's chair. Yeah. What the heck's going on here? <laughs> and Scotty's hair is funky, too. Yeah, he's got that updo again. Yeah, but note, his hairstyle actually will change later in the episode. Yeah. Yeah, wow. take a look at him later on. His hair is a little more unkempt. I love the backgrounds here. Yeah, great painted backdrop. Mm-hmm. Great painted. Very futuristic looking. I like the, uh, if you look kind of to the right, there's a, it looks almost like a house on top of a, pillar with a spike sticking out of the top of yeah. it. Yeah, and then to the left you have like two things that look like almost something out of the World's Fair. And yeah, it's good observation. Good yeah. observation. So it's funny, you think at this point, Scotty's got to be pretty comfortable in that captain's chair. He's been left in charge many <laughs> times. And it's funny that you say that because you would think that while he's comfortable in the captain's chair, you'd think they'd stop responding to these random distress calls. <laughs> I, I mean, is is the Enterprise like an intergalactic ambulance? I mean, well, not by constantly... their own admission. I mean, by, you know, the opening voiceover is to explore strange new worlds, you know, and uh, yeah, it seems like they're uh, they're just the first responders for everything. I guess so. I guess so. Very, very weird. But uh, once again, very odd things happening. You know, uh, seemingly some insects flying around or whatnot. But uh, this planet was a, I found was interesting, is a rating seven on the industrial scale, which um, the industrial scale is not really well defined in Star yeah. Trek. But I mean, it pops up a few different times. But apparently at this point, rank seven is the highest that you can be on mm. the industrial scale. So these were very highly advanced people. But if you keep your eye on the background here, what I think is fine is interesting, and watch what the red shirt guy does. What rubs <laughs> water on his mouth. <laughs> Alien water. Very yeah. weird. Yeah, well, maybe he had, you know, uh, some salt on his lips or something he had to clear off, yeah. you know. You it know looks that... like they're, they're collecting samples for analysis. And uh, without even testing the water, he rubbed it on his face and then disappeared. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a little bit of a red herring? Potentially, mm-hmm. well, we or well, is it actually a full-on herring? Yeah, it may be a full-on herring because later on we <laughs> yeah. find out that uh, that water is uh, kind of toxic. Yeah, no, it was funny. That was such a throwaway moment. I didn't even notice that lip wipe until you pointed it out, and then uh, that's pretty integral. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wonder if if um, I, I don't think I picked up on that in previous watchings of this episode. I picked it up when I watched it, this again for our discussion. Yeah, And I was kind of watching it with very close eyes if I could pick up anything interesting uh, to mention here. And that really stuck out to me as a, another red shirt blunder. Yeah. And you've, th- you've, you've gone through the series a couple of times now, right? Oh, many, many times. And yeah. some of these episodes, like this one in particular, happens to be a favorite of mine. So mm-hmm. I've watched this probably more than some other ones. Yeah, I got to say that this is an episode that I would have to add to my... Prior to this, I've seen it once list. Really? Yeah. I mean, sitting down to watch it, I couldn't remember um, where the story was going um, or any key moments from it. So this was probably an episode that I haven't watched since probably the mid to late 90s. Really? Yeah. So it was a a little bit of a treat. Wow. Well, I I hope that as we discuss this, I'll be able to glean your overall opinion on whether or not you like it. Mm -hmm. Um, but see, there's Scotty's hairstyles changed. Oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. So two different hairstyles for Scotty. Um, I, I I love the concept of this episode, and although they haven't revealed uh, exactly what's going on yet, I think it's probably fair to say most people listening to this podcast know uh, this episode yeah. already. So uh-huh. I, I love the, the concept of accelerated beings that are moving so quickly we can't see them. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that concept. The way they, they the way they explain how it happened is a little bit sketchy mm-hmm. in my eyes. But I really enjoy the concept and, and the way they execute it in this episode I think is excellent. So that's why this is one of my, my favorite third season episodes. I just think the, the, the concept is brilliant and the execution is, is very good. Yeah, and this is an episode to me that feels like and we've talked about or at least I've I've mentioned my feelings on how the second season sort of really amped up the weirdness factor. Mm-hmm. 
And this definitely feels like an episode to me that would have worked sort of in that really weird batch of season two episodes. Um, it definitely feels like it's got that same spirit. For sure. I, I see where you're going with that. And it, uh, I think it stands out over a lot of the other season three episodes uh, just by the fact that you can, you say it can fit in season two and I can see it fitting in season two. Uh, and it's a, it's a Lee Cronin story. Yeah. Yeah. Gene L. Coon. It's a, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is this the last writing job he did for the show? Oh God, I had to look that up. It might've been. Yeah. Cause he was off doing his, his other, his other gig by this point. Yeah. Did you notice something that, that jumped out at me earlier also is there's a lot of malfunctions going on in the Enterprise right now. <laughs> yes. And, and it's, it's caused by, of course, the, the aliens. But I, I love this, Kirk's reaction to one of the earlier ones. He asked Sulu if the repair crews had, had already been assigned to fix or, or uh, track down this problem. That made me wonder, he, does, he doesn't have to actually order repair crews is it an automatic dispatch kind of thing if something goes wrong like you know the computer or someone in engineering automatically says okay crew x go fix this thing yeah you'd think there'd probably be some kind of alert system yeah potentially they've got to have some kind of a maintenance system going on yeah that you know the captain's probably aware of he probably gets a report every day or whatever but you know you've probably got crews that their sole purpose is to do preventative maintenance Mm -hmm. Uh um must be delegated delegated work that yeah, the captain but, doesn't always have to be clued into. Yeah, so is the computer opening those work orders? That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> if it's an automatic thing, because we'll see some interesting computer interaction later on too, where it, the the computer displays some sort of intelligence that we may or may not know that it had. Yeah, by default. Mm-hmm. And how do you even open up a trouble ticket on the Enterprise? Probably by voice. I would imagine you just talking to the thing in the wall. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's some kind of a switchboard. Maybe a call center on the Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Enterprise it's on what, like a, a certain deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rotating. So then they, they, they're not. They're only one language. You can't call in with an alien language. Got to speak English. And they don't work for Starfleet. No, they're outsourced. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you know, one thing I really thought was kind of funny about this scene is why is Kirk the only one and hears the noise? McCoy's yeah. right next to him. It stands to reason that McCoy could have heard it as well. Yeah. Uh, but McCoy goes on record later on after Kirk vanishes and tells Spock, oh, I've been hearing that since we beamed back from the planet. But now McCoy seems to hear it. Yeah. Although Kirk is is wondering if he's gone uh, gone kind of insane and is hallucinating, and McCoy tells him no. Yeah. He doesn't think so. But he doesn't have any confirmation of that. He's just going by what his preliminary exam that he didn't even finish. Yeah. Tells yeah. him. So, Interesting. So now, this is something we've never heard them do before. When uh, when an alien, a hostile alien or an alien has taken over the ship, Kirk has ordered uh, phasers issued and communicators be issued to everybody since the uh, communication system has been compromised. Yeah. Oh. But I don't see any communicators on those red shirts. Uh, interesting, though, they have enough communicators so that 430 people can each have one. Yeah, look at that. And 430 phasers. So they can fully arm the entire crew with hand phasers mm-hmm. and communicators. That's interesting. I never want. I always wondered if how many phasers there were on board. You think there's got to be more than enough? You know, they have to have backup ones as well. I would think so, but I don't know. It's a good question because I mean, you see, sometimes you'll see like the little drawer open and there's like six phasers in it. Mm-hmm. So they must have some big cache of weapons somewhere on the ship. And do they have serial numbers? They have to. They have to. Because they can usually tell when one's missing. Wasn't there an episode where they could tell there was phaser missing? Or Oh, look, environmental engineering. Yeah. Now we know there's an environmental engineering section. I guess that's where the life support system is. Mm-hmm. And there's this really interesting looking, almost TOS-era Borg-like machine <laughs> yeah. wired in with those uh, those metal tubes coming out of it. Yeah. So pretty neat. I always love when you can see things in here that kind of look Borgish, Right. Yeah. And a selective force field, by the way, earlier. Yeah, yeah. That, that Kirk and Spock could pass through, but not the, the two red shirts. Mm-hmm. So this thing, they've determined that it's partially installed. Uh, the installation was not complete. Yep. And they've got some more physical acting there, a uh, callback to uh, 
to last week's episode. Yeah, I and mean, then back to Plato's stepchildren. So we'll see a little bit of that in this episode. Not nearly as much as Plato. But uh, right now we still have these invisible aliens who are uh, muscling the crew around. Which I, I was wondering to myself, if they move that quickly, I mean, I guess it's kind of judging by whatever uh, evidence we've seen is that they're, they sound like insects. So that means they're talking extremely, extremely fast, right? And yeah. very high pitched talking. So if they were to hit you or brush against you, wouldn't the reaction be extreme? Wouldn't you be thrown across the room? I mean, they have to be moving really fast. Oh, you'd think so, because we see moments where, like, you know, the crew is frozen. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, you would have to have such a ginger touch to not either, you know, hurt them or or cause or cause an, a serious injury. Yeah, breaking bones at least. Mm -hmm. But now here's the here's a, the computer is being asked questions in plain English. This is like uh, like Google, right? Yeah. By a voice. <laughs> so they're able to ask the computer questions in plain sentences in plain English, and the computer will either tell them uh, not enough data, or it will give them answers. So the yeah. computer is saying that they should negotiate with these aliens because there's no escape or no possibility of overpowering them. Yeah, and I love that they have a, a drink girl just walking. <laughs> yeah, the with, with coffee. With coffee. Um, that brings me a, a question I want to ask you, Jeff. I know oh. you're 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 sort of tech minded. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Do you think um, the computers in Trek um, are way off base with what we will probably have in the 23rd century in terms of AI and because the computers now in Trek seem they don't seem too far off from where from where we are right now, technology wise. No, well, I think we're. I mean, as far as what we've just seen with the voice recognition and answering, I think we're we're on par or surpassing this now, actually. Um, I mean, you know, we, we all have smartphones, I guess, and we can talk to our phones and they can tell us stuff. I mean, of course, they have to be tethered to the Internet to do so. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the what we're seeing on Trek, you know, now in this particular episode, I think we have stuff on par or slightly better at this point. So pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine where where we're going to be from a, a technology standpoint come, you know, the, the 23rd century. Unfortunately, we probably won't be around to see it. Yeah. You and wow, me. Way, way to bring down the podcast. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, hey, hey, we're realists over here. I love the tilted camera angles here and the, the tilting camera and the slow-mo yeah, to show yeah. you what Kirk is feeling after drinking that uh, tainted coffee. Yeah, it's like they slowed down some of the Batman 66 shots. <laughs> I was about to say he winds up in a, a the villain's lair in yeah. a Batman episode. Yeah, and this is a, a director who had who worked on a, a total of five Trek episodes, Judd Taylor, born in 1932. Um, previously, he had worked on the Paradise Syndrome. Oh. Um, but we're next going to see him on the Mark of Gideon and the Cloud Minders. Oh, I like that one. And he was also uh, nominated for directing in 1977 for an Emmy for Tail Gunner Joe, which was the Joseph McCarthy story. Hmm. Um, and he was played by Peter Boyle. Cool. Yeah. Weird cliffhanger commercial break there. Yeah, with the introduction of uh, Dila. Did you see? I, I love the the reveal when, when, when Kirk sees her. He kind of gets a smirk on his face like, <laughs> hot chick. And he's like, wait a minute. Whoa, hold on. Back up a second. Yeah, how'd she get here? Wait a minute. So, um, yeah, and she immediately kind of jumps on him. Yeah. And he pushes her off, which is kind of very unkirk like but but cool. And uh, so he, he refuses two makeout sessions here. Yeah, but he'll make up for that later. Or, oh, he certainly will. <laughs> and uh, interesting that she's so um, scantily dressed. Mm -hmm. You know, this, and this is, I guess, this is what she wears every single day. You know, one one half of her is almost exposed, and the other half is covered with a almost like an iridescent sort of um, fabric. I love the little communication uh, things they have on their neck. That's kind of a, a flash forward to the next generation style communicators, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're built into your into your insignia there. So they got kind of this dual thing with the insignia slash communicator uh, on their necks. But that m may actually be her hair. 
that bun oh, yeah. in the back there mm-hmm. instead of uh, the, the the wigs we've seen a lot of the actresses wearing. There is a lot of hair there. That is a lot. Yeah. And that's actress uh, Kathy Brown, who died back in 2003 at the age of 72. But she had done so much TV work. It really um, was amazing to go through her her filmography. And she did multiple episodes of the following series. So that means she was on more than one episode, sometimes playing a different character. Mm. Sea Hunt, Rawhide, Have Gun Will Travel, Wagon Train, 77 Sunset Strip, Bonanza, Perry Mason, and Ironside. Um, and that's only the shows that she had multiple appearances on. So uh, wow. she was very, very active. And she was also married to Darren McGavin from oh, 1969 wow. until her death. Oh, it's, it's how long? How, when, when did she pass away? 2003. Oh, wow. That's a, like 11 years ago. It's almost yeah. 12 years ago. Wow. And she had a hell of a career, though. Yeah. I mean, anytime you see those people that, uh, that have multiple uh, episode appearances as different characters, we've seen it on Trek before. And um, I always love seeing that because it really shows that somebody involved in the production, uh, you know, had an opinion of the actor that they held in high regard and wanted to find ways to use them uh, multiple times. So it's very cool. Yeah, that is very cool. I've often said, too, that I love how these people would appear on multiple shows. And, you know, they they, it kind of showed that, you know, Star Trek was on on a budget, but they still wanted to get quality guest actors. So. You know, they would they would kind of go out of their way to find really good people to be on these shows. And most of the time, these the guest actors, with the exception of a couple, um, are, are really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've talked about some of the some of the great guest stars. And this kind of dovetails. Well, look at this. Her dodging. I love the, that effect. The, the phaser shot. Uh, that's a great effect. Mm-hmm. I love how the, the, the phaser wasn't affected. So what happened when he shot that phaser in real time? That's a good question. So the phaser, the phaser shot at normal speed while he's moving at high speed. So you would think it would have damaged the bridge, <laughs> yeah. and Scotty and Spock and whomever else was there would have seen it. Yeah, it's. I guess it's just one of those moments you have to sort of just go with. And for... I love how, um, yeah, you definitely have to go with with that. There's, it, there's a couple of other ones that'll pop up, but I love how they set these shots up. On the bridge, so they didn't have to have anybody else sitting there frozen yeah. <laughs> while they're doing it. So stands to reason, uh, you know, Spock, who we, we know is sitting off to the left, and Scotty off to the right, are not actually uh, on the set right now mm-hmm. as they're filming this. So uh, it w- I imagine it would have been very hard to keep still for this entire dialogue bit. Oh, yeah. That's going on for you. I know he kind of pushes her out of the way and keeps going. Now we see the communi- close-up of the communication device. Yeah. Pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat. So she offered Kirk the kingship on the planet below. Yeah. Which, uh, that's quite a generous offer. Yeah, especially considering that she hadn't completely, um, you know, taken him for a test drive, if you will, not (laughs) to be, to try and be as, uh, you know, as far from crude as I can be. Oh, well, understood. Understood. A couple frozen red shirts here, but one unfrozen red shirt. Yep. And I love how fast this guy turned on Kirk. Yeah, he's like, "Hey, this is my new, this is my new reality." And over I've a got... chick. Yeah. He's like, "No, no, 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 not letting Kirk in." And I, he was he the guy that they he was the guy they got down on the planet, right? I guess yeah, that was the guy that um... Compton. Yeah. Yeah, Compton. He uh, and he's got one of their phasers, by the way, which is good continuity right there. Oh, I didn't even catch that. Since we've already seen that the regular Trek phasers don't work, uh, he he needs to have a a, a Scalosian phaser in order to be able to to take Kirk out. So we know that they're they're got some sort of a plot here, and they're utilizing Compton to help out. And he's keeping poor Kirk out of the room, but <laughs> that doesn't last long. Get out of here! I like how he almost hits the camera too. Yeah. Oh, oh, and poor Kirk takes a stun shot. Yeah, and he does a nice backwards fall. Yeah, he really fall. does. Good, good physical acting there by Shatner. That's yeah. uh, That ain't easy to do. You got to have some leg strength to be able to go down that slow. Oh, yeah, and your core, too. Yeah, and I wonder how uh, how many times they had to do that, how many takes they needed to, to get him to go down the right way. Uh-oh. Compton, Compton dies from a seemingly tiny cut on his neck. 
Yeah. Hmm. And I guess we're getting another reveal here that accelerated human beings are very susceptible to injury. Mm-hmm. And any minor injury that causes any kind of cell damage can uh, can break them and and cause them to die. So Kirk is in a very uh, tenuous position now where any minor injury can kill him. So he's in he's in pretty grave danger, even though it, it really almost doesn't seem like Kirk is in all that much danger through this episode. But I think if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, I mean, if he cuts himself shaving, he's dead. <laughs> yeah. You know, although we don't know how they shave. We don't. We can stub his toe, trip yeah. and fall. You, know, you never know. Yeah, yeah that, that would be rough. But we, we do know that the, the, the time bomb, of course, or the the sticking point is, of course, Kirk is under the impression that he cannot get back to the regular uh, human speed. He is stuck yeah. at the Scalosian speed, and that's what they've told him. Yeah. And, and uh, interesting, they seem to really believe it. In fact, that they, they, she'll even tell us later that uh, they, they've they tried to uh, find ways to to survive or, or to get back, and they were unable to do so. And being that they were a, a seven on the industrial scale, you would think that they would have been able to figure out uh, what McCoy and Spock figure out later, right? Yeah. Yeah, but nah, maybe they just didn't think about it. But, <laughs> but Or maybe they really did, uh, deep down inside, enjoy um, this state of being. Perhaps, perhaps. Well, I, it, it does give them a lot of advantages, and it, from what uh, Dila was saying earlier, it sure seems like they've done this kind of thing before. Yeah. Where they've lured in a ship full of people and, you know, cryogenically frozen them in order to keep their civilization going. And I guess now they need more. Mm-hmm. So they've got quite a cash here on the Enterprise with 430 people on board. Right. Yeah. I wonder what they would do with Spock. They seem to be humanish themselves. What would they do with a Vulcan? Would they try to breed the Vulcan into their society? Oh, yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one dude's got a pretty hairy back. <laughs> I just noticed that. Damn it, Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with all the uh, detail. Oh yeah, it's great. So I, I love this scene, and I, I love how we're also still at an angle. The camera is still at an angle, but I love how Kirk risks grievous bodily harm by grabbing onto this device and and attempting to break it. Yeah, and 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 not letting go in order to try. Any desperate thing he can think of to save the ship and the crew from this fate, which right now it doesn't seem like it's a heck of a of any 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 way he can get out of this. Mm-hmm. So he he's pretty stuck. He's got to rely on, you know, whatever he can figure out. But you wonder if if Spock could have just drank Kirk's coffee because he didn't drink the whole thing. You know, yeah. the cup was sitting there and he has it. And he could have just yeah. drank it and accelerated. But I mean. It- at this point, have they realized that? They haven't realized that the coffee's the the cause. Well, they're testing the coffee. Yeah. Because it was the last thing he did. I mean, I guess Spock isn't that uh, spontaneous, but I would have thought somebody would have been that spontaneous and, and just kind of gulped some coffee down. And uh, oh, Poor Compton has aged out. Yeah. So this, this reminds me of um, the deadly years. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the rapid aging, but this is even faster. So I, I, I now that makes me wonder though, if I guess when you the the aging wasn't what killed him, right? The the cut killed him. Yeah. But then he what did he did did dying return him to his uh, normal rate of of speed and that made him age super quickly. I don't know what, I'm not sure how the aging works or maybe, um, (laughs) yeah, I I got, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't think you can really assume that getting back to regular speed aged him because then it, you know, we wouldn't be able to, you know, Kirk wouldn't be able to go back or, you know, um, it's got to be related to his injury, which is maybe, maybe the injury, um, makes you, um, age in response to the, the speed that you're moving at. Yeah. 
I guess I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost tough. like you know wearing a bulletproof vest and then then not wearing a bulletproof vest. You know what I mean? Hmm. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, t- it's a tough one. I I don't know. It's a head scratcher. Anybody yeah. out there has an opinion, please share it with us. Maybe some of our regular listeners will have an idea. Uh, so this is a great ploy here by Kirk. I I I love this uh, this the scheme he's come up with that he's going to record all of this stuff on a computer tape and then find a way to get it to Spock and McCoy mm-hmm. so they know exactly what's going on because they really don't have a way to figure it out right right now. Mm-hmm. So and and I I I love that that Dila is so confident in the fact that they can't possibly be defeated. Yeah. That she just lets them do it. Mhm. Because she said, well, this, the tape's going to be useless to them, but for historical record, uh, you might as well just go ahead and do it. Yeah, and like any sort of flawed villain in a movie, um, it's sort of their arrogance that is normally their downfall. Mm-hmm. Oh, and they're extremely arrogant, too. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're almost more arrogant than many of the other uh, Trek alien species we've seen that, yeah. had, that had powers like that. They're, they're almost at like a Trelane level <laughs> arrogance. <laughs> So, and, and she, you know, so Kirk has pretty much laid out the entire scenario for McCoy and Spock to listen to. And, and what's really going on is they're turning the enterprise into a giant botany bay, if you will, <laughs> freezing everybody yeah. in a cryogenic stasis so that they can thaw some people out here and there and use them to, uh, as, as breeding stock. Right. Yeah. So, uh, interesting turn of events that, that, uh. The Enterprise winds up becoming uh, the next Botany Bay, and uh, maybe they'll be four thousand year old men by the time they wind up thawing them all out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who knows? But interesting stuff. Another commercial fade, and I, you know, I are these still shots? They've got to be still shots. I don't know. It's it's tough to tell. Hey, that well, that that last one that came up just after the commercial break looked like it, it was a was a still, mm-hmm. um, but if if that was not a still, you know, good on the uh, McCoy and and Spock and Chapel for staying that still. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I didn't well, it, it, it's definitely possible if you remember the the end of every episode of Police Squad. <laughs> <Good Lord>. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, we're getting a little explanation here as to how. The Scalosian people wound up getting accelerated. Right. And it was radiation. Mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, if you if you look at the past, uh, you know, comic books and movies and all the things that we've, we've seen over the years, that radiation is responsible for so many supervillains. You know, how many supervillains in comic books are created by being exposed to some kind of radiation? And good and, guys, and, too. And superheroes, yeah. I mean, yeah. Spider-Man is a Hulk. radioactive spider. Yeah. Hulk. Yeah. Um, I believe the Fantastic Four, didn't they get yep. their powers in Outer the... Outer space. Yeah, the, like the, I guess, that barrier in space. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So, I guess radiation. I mean, let's let's uh, go out and find some radiation. <laughs> I got sadly, it. Sadly, it just kills you in reality. Yeah, I know. I know. But, pretty neat use of radiation here. Yeah. And... I really have to hand it to Kirk that he he's even though you know they're they're attempting to pretty much kidnap and enslave his entire crew he's still going to attempt diplomacy. Yeah, see. I don't think that's a frozen shot. At least there it's not. Mm. Then you might be right on that. I think a lot of times when when you're seeing a frozen shot, it's a little softer than normal because it's oh, it's yeah. But there, that that looked pretty. That looked pretty sharp. Yeah, it's pretty good. And I I love how Kirk is offering to uh, to use everything at Starfleet's disposal to get them to help them if he'll if they'll just kind of let the crew go. Which yeah, I think is it. That's really admirable that he's trying that. Now I don't think that that's just a ploy. I, I really think that if she relented and 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 let the crew go that he would have made good on that oh yeah i really think he would have made good on that and you know how many how many starfleet captains would do the same thing you know who knows we've seen so many corrupted ones yeah some might find try and find a way to make it benefit them yeah really 
to recruit these people to do some nefarious things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, his offer has to be kind of compelling to her, though. Oh, sure. You know, and watch this. I love this move. He's so Ooh. slick with this. Where he just grabs that yeah. little tape out of the computer while she's talking and kind of quietly sneaks it into the other computer in front of Spock and then slips out the door. <laughs> yeah. So Kirk's got a little rogue in him. Oh, it's great. So very, very uh, brilliant move there. And he's on his way to do something else very brilliant. As uh, McCoy and Spock were flashback, now McCoy and Spock are uh, checking the water, mm-hmm. and he finds that the Scalosian water and the captain's coffee have some of the same properties. Mm-hmm. Now, real quick, I um, and well, here we have Shatner uh, or Kirk, doing a quick disable job on the, the transporter. Great move on his part to do Yeah, it. and, and Dila, uh, she completely um, dismisses it. She says he didn't have time to do anything. Mm-hmm. Which is which is pretty funny because... But we clearly saw him take something out. Yeah, but I just like the fact that she said there's he didn't have enough time to disable it. Like, yep. is she an expert on the transporter? <laughs> and he's playing it so cool. Oh, yeah. He knows it's not going to work. But, I, you know, this... This scene in the transporter room, what what happens now, what happens after he steps steps off the transporter, really made me think of James Bond, like yeah. the way that he uses uh, his technical expertise as well as that suave. Mm-hmm. He's like totally playing her. Yeah, you know he dis he snuck in, disabled the transporter, and now he's gonna go over there and you know just kind of put the moves on her, right? Yeah, that's really really cool. That, that's something that Bond would do, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. As a as a Bond fan, I would I would have I would have thought you'd have found that a, a, a kind of a James Bond parallel. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there he goes, and you know th- this is great because Kirk really hasn't had a chance to use that intergalactic swagger in a few episodes. <laughs> you know, everybody else has been getting the girls, but look at that eye movement that he does. I mean, the the expressions that he has on his face without any dialogue. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, he's totally playing her. So. And she's kind of talking herself out of it. She's talking herself out of the fact. I mean, she knows he did something. Yeah. But she's kind of talking herself out of it by saying, you know, you, you're I, you're not devious, are you? You know, I don't like devious people. Like, no, nah, not me, man. I play with your hair. It's all good. I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you one thing that okay. I'm wondering if um it's just if it's just me, but the last couple of episodes I've noticed. Uh, a different in a uh, difference in Spock's delivery or the way that Nimoy is playing Spock, and I'm not sure if it's just something that I'm I'm tricking myself into seeing and hearing, but to me it seems like Nimoy made some kind of adjustment for this third season. You think so? His voice, the, the cadence uh, that he uses, it just sounds it sounds more in search of to me than classic mm. Spock. Um, maybe in a couple of scenes, I, I picked up on a little bit of that, but not, not as, as, uh, not a full time thing. Um, yeah, I, I think it's Plato's stepchildren. He did seem a little bit different. Uh, yeah. this episode, I thought he seemed pretty normal. Yeah. It's just, I, I don't know if it's just the after effects of, of, of Plato's stepchildren messing with me, but <laughs> it definitely felt like, um, um, there was something different. Oh, and here we have, this is the, uh, I guess, uh, what you could call a famous, you know, you know, captain putting his boots back on scene. Yeah, coming up. Oh, can did you, that not pass? Not yet. Can oh, okay. You, can you figure out what that painting is on Kirk's wall? I was trying to figure out what that is. It almost looks like it could be a planet. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's tough to see. It's it's kind of um, uh, bouquet out in the background there. Mm-hmm. But I love the the. The, the the setup of the the shot prior to this where she was combing her hair in the mirror and you could see Kirk talking to her his reflection in the mirror yeah I thought that was a really great shot uh-huh very effective um, and she's kind of worrying about how she looks mm-hmm. I guess and trying to to look pretty I guess for Kirk to uh, to impress him but now he's just kind of buying time here yeah so I you know he's making it seem like he's really interested in her but he just kind of he disabled the transporter, and he's now he's buying time for uh, Spock and McCoy to find that tape and listen to it. But the you are leading up to the uh, famous putting the boot back on yeah. scene and the implication that that makes. 
but uh, long time spent in Kirk's quarters here, but you don't get to see a heck of a lot of it. Uh, he's got the same standard drawers and mirror thing that uh, other crew members have in their quarters. So his quarters don't look to be any more uh, ornate or, or or larger than than anybody else's. So the captain doesn't really have like a, a suite or something. Yeah, and, uh, like, and I guess that's one advantage of many that the mirror Kirk had. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, Mira Kirk had some uh, other amenities <laughs> included. But I, I like his Spock is doing some uh, some sleuthing here by playing yeah. around with the tape. He says he knows what the noises are, what the insect noises are. So I guess that's how he's proving out his theory that uh, it's these fast-moving people. And he's slowing down the, the distress call tape and speeding up the distress call tape. Yeah, but now we're also getting into, like, the Menagerie Part 1 and 2 territory where they have tapes of them um, on the planet. Yeah, I guess we're supposed to think that whatever they do on these planet services is recorded somehow. <laughs> because we saw McCoy on the security yeah. tape. We saw the guy disappearing, right? Yeah, yeah. And now Spock's speeding it up so we don't see anything but a bunch of lines. But we've seen that happen before, and here they are again. There's with the guy different in the background. camera shots. I guess the, the Enterprise is equipped with... Some kind of technology, long distance. I, 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 it bothered me in the in the menagerie, and it bothers me here. Yeah, it is a little bit strange, isn't it? Yeah, and I guess, but I mean, yeah. it, it 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 it's necessary because uh, it really is wonderful to watch Spock's mind work in this sequence. And you see him kind of nodding mm -hmm. and smiling, and you can see him kind of the you can see the wheels turning. Yeah. Uh, so that almost makes it forgivable. But for me, that seems like a technology that's really, really pretty far out. Yeah. I wonder how much post-production work went into that audio slowing down and speeding up mm. uh, in sync with the video on the monitor there. Because it's not like nonlinear editing like we have today where that's kind of a, just a, a, a number you type in or a slider you move. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that easy back then. No, to do audio effects and video effects like that. So, I wonder, uh, wonder how that was done and how much work went into that post production. Hmm. Great shot here. It pan sort of panned through the 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 bridge, up and down. Uh, really great as they're listening. It's a good way to show them all in a kind of a bust, uh, mm -hmm. you know, chest up style shot without having to do cuts. Mm -hmm. which might have been a little jarring uh, for the viewer to watch uh, just cuts of every character. Yeah, and it almost becomes comical. Yeah, it does. It does. I agree. So now the transporter is being repaired Yeah. by the Scalosian. So apparently they understand how to fix the technology as well as use it. I mean, I guess you could say this is another one of those con scenarios for me. Like, they, they had enough time to read all the manuals and understand how everything worked? Well, they actually had a lot of time. If you look at the, from the instant that they were on the ship to the instant that Kirk becomes one of them, for lack of a better word, that had to be days in their time, right? Yeah, I was thinking that, but even days. I mean, the Enterprise is not a simple, there's the boot scene, by the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so implied, implied space sex has happened here. Yeah. I know this is this is what Matt Walski uh, returned when I uh, queried about uh, Miramani being the only proof that Kirk ever actually did have sex uh -huh. with any sort of alien woman. Uh, yes, <laughs> because of the the production of a child. But I, I mean, I, I guess the boot is a, an implication. Oh, it's that something it, I, happened. She wasn't giving him a foot massage. Well, maybe he had a rock in his shoe. <laughs> you know, he was down on the planet's surface. Yeah, end up in like a little space rock down there, or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still, I still maintain that the the w woman that he impregnated is the only evidence that he actually did <laughs> have any sex with any alien women. I don't know. I'm just gonna go with that. Uh, uh, but we had a little love triangle going on. Yeah, little love triangle. You gotta love it. And you know, she really is playing, um, Rail, right? Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, he, she is really playing him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she she just stunned the poor guy, and uh, you know, 
she obviously, you know, earlier we saw him, you know, pretty aggressively attempting to, to kiss her. And now, you know, he, he, his feelings are well known by her and she's still, you know, kind of keeping him strung along while she looks for, uh, I guess someone she likes better. Yeah. That's kind of messed up. Yeah, it is. But, uh, you know, I guess it's, I guess their society isn't very much different than humans. I mean, we do stuff like that here, don't we? Yep. So, you know, and poor Kirk is caught in the middle. I know. I know. And this is actor Jason Evers. Um, he died in, two, uh, in 2005 uh, at the age of 83. He did a lot of TV work as well. Gunsmoke, Bonanza, The Wild Wild West, and Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. And you can also see him in the movie Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, we're coming up on a crossover between Trek and Planet of the Apes. Yeah, so that's yeah. Pretty cool. And that's actually one of the watchable Planet of the Apes sequels. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> there, there are many, and uh, they kind of drop off quality-wise. Ba I st I'm still not sure that I can ever sit through the entirety of Battle of the Planet of the Apes ever again. Oh, yeah. I don't know, I don't know how, how long it's been since I've seen that one, but... Yeah, that one's, yeah. That one's a tough one. Now, here is more of Kirk thinking on his feet, and I, I love all of, the, all of the, the quick solutions he tries to come up with here. Now he's playing along with something that she said a while ago where people who are accelerated will acclimate and become kind of docile yeah. after a while and just resign to their fate and kind of go along with it. And I guess Kirk remembered that and he's playing like he's now okay with everything. And this is almost like he had gotten shot with those spores, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Remember, remember the spores that everybody got shot with back in um, this side of paradise and uh, <laughs> the one that made Spock fall in love. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a different Kirk, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he's speaking very strangely, uh, and he's looking. I, I love how he's kind of looking at, at the camera with his head tilted sideways, kind of like a goofy sort of far off look, like he just smoked up or something. <laughs> 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 and uh, he's got her fooled. And here is the potential uh, accelerant and cure by Spock and McCoy. And I, uh, you know, I wonder is it logical? For Spock to drink that stuff down? Well, obviously, because he drinks it. I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't really comment on whether or not it's logical. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he just put the antidote in his back pocket, didn't he? Yeah. Two vials of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think from Spock's perspective, it's logical in the sense that he'll be able to go talk to the captain. True. And I love his reaction. You seem to be moving very slowly, mm -hmm. and the camera tilts. Yeah, you know, that I, effect. This transition effect is really great. It is, and I, I think it's a subtle way of letting us know what I guess universe we're looking at. Because mm -hmm. when we're looking at the regular speed, we see the regular flat, you know, camera angles. When we're seeing the accelerated one, it's tilted. So I think yeah. it's a very subtle way to let the audience know. Uh, you know what they're supposed to be look see here we are in the accelerated one and it's tilted again mm -hmm. so it's so pretty cool and it was it was you know used in, in batman very famously in the 60s series to let us know we were looking at the villain's place as opposed to a, a good place mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of effective because you got that awkward look to it oh yeah but there's a there's a scene here coming up in the hallway uh, they're getting ready to activate the unit here and yeah, you know, here she is playing him again. You know, letting her know that she's sorry, and that you know she still wants to be with him because now Kirk's boring. Mm -hmm. Now that he's acclimated, he's boring, and uh, he's still playing along. But there's a uh, there's a really cool little uh, little scene coming up here in the hallway. But so they're activating this device to freeze them, and I guess they're all trying to evacuate the ship. Uh, mm -hmm. prior to the freeze actually happening and kirk pulls the old switcheroo yeah grabs her phaser and runs out the door mm -hmm. uh, and i love this i love this unspoken moment here mm -hmm. where kirk runs into the hallway sees spock briefly smiles yeah and just continues on like all right you know what to do we're so in tune with each other we've been here before I don't even have to say, Spock, it's you. 
He just he knows that Spock's figured out what's going on because Spock always does. And Spock has sped himself up to assist Kirk and everything's going to be cool from here on out. Yeah, if you're putting together a montage of great Kirk and Spock moments, that's definitely one that you grab. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I just it, I love the the look on Kirk's face. So, and how quickly Dila admits defeat. Mhm. You know, they've blown the the machine up there. So, uh no more cryogenic freeze for the Enterprise. But I mean, they still have a couple other people she could try to beam back up, but I guess um She's by herself. She's got no weapon now. Yeah. And I, I love that Kirk is still diplomatic. Mm hmm You know, he's he she assumes that they're gonna that the, the crew is gonna kill them all or or send them back to the planet to die. But Kirk is still offering them the olive branch. So good on Kirk, man. Oh yeah. I gotta say, he doesn't even try to take any kind of revenge. All he wanna do is save his ship and his crew. Mm-hmm. Even though one of his crew members was killed. Yeah, you know what? That's a that's a really good point. Diplomatic to the end. So and that's that's pretty much uh almost gonna wrap it up. One one more really cool uh, little scene here at the end coming up that, that we want we should probably talk about a bit, but um I like that uh that Kirk is kind of just sending her back on her way and they don't kinda don't really resolve it though. For the no. Skolosians, do they? They they don't they don't really say whether or not Starfleet ever went back to help the people out and you know try to bring them the cure to slow them back down again that that Spock and McCoy invented. You would think that they would be able to just beam down there and hand them a few, or leave a few on the ground for them to pick up. Yeah, and uh, say here, drink these, kind of mm -hmm. like an Alice in Wonderland sort of thing. Right. But now here's a question too: is you know, we, we determined that the phaser doesn't speed up. Does How does the transporter work on those fast people? Yeah. You know, how does the transporter adjust to them? I, I, the instruments weren't really able to pick them up on the scan. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. And poor Scotty's frozen in the doorway. Yeah. Yeah. So they've he's got the counter agent for the water. Spock A possible the counter agent. So uh, this yes, is where yes. we're biting our... You know, biting our, our, our fingernails in hopes that it works. Yes. And Kirk downs it immediately, but Spock does not. Yeah. Because Spock has a plan, as he always does. Yeah, this is such a, a badass moment. It is. This is a big, big, cool moment for Spock. And what this would be on one of my Spock montages if I ever made one. <laughs> <laughs> of really, really awesome things Spock has done. Yeah. I love how nonchalant Spock is too. Yeah, you seem to be moving very slowly there, Captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you notice it's not a gradual thing for Scotty. Yeah, it's just boom. You won't think that that for a, a a brief moment or so, or even for a little bit longer than a brief moment, Scotty would see Kirk moving really quickly. Yeah, but who knows? But here is the 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 most awesome Spock thing Spock has ever done. When you couldn't see him actually doing it. <laughs> yeah, he's going around and he's repairing all of the defective um, equipment. Yes, while he's uh, still accelerated. Yeah, at a speed that Scotty cannot comprehend. Yes, because it's happening at the the accelerated um, scalosion speed. So he could have been doing that for days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Spock could have been working on all of these systems for, for, for many days. And you, you wonder why uh, maybe Scotty didn't drink a little bit down and go help him. <laughs> you know you would think that they could do that yeah but and that pretty much uh wraps it up yeah. for wink of an eye spock found it to be an accelerating experience uh, 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 i see what he did there and we get the poor scalosian people looking as if they're about to cry yeah and you get this really sort of it's it's instant nostalgia from from kirk yeah, he's like, oh, no, yeah, no, it's not a malfunction of her. It's okay. I'm going to look at these people who I just pretty much condemned. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I guess we're supposed to think that maybe Kirk had some actual feelings for that girl. I, I didn't think he did. I thought it was pretty much a ploy. Mm -hmm. But maybe he did. I don't know. Yeah. But it's central voting time. All right. Um. 
I think you went first last week, so I'll, I'll jump in this week and say um, there's nothing on display here that would cause me to call this uh, an essential episode. It's one of those cases where you have a really engaging, interesting, easy to watch, entertaining episode that just doesn't deliver anything in the essential category. So for me, it's it's a it's a non-essential. I agree completely. So by my own rules, and I, I quote all the time: no recurring aliens introduced, uh, no no background information on characters, or uh, no no big character moments, no new technical. Uh, things and no new you know phasers no new you know ship technology no new nothing so uh, as much as i really enjoy this episode is another one for me that i really like that i can't call essential so all right double non-essential all right well that wraps up another episode and uh, as always you can find us on facebook at facebook.com slash tricorder transmissions uh twitter at ttt underscore pod and at the tricorder transmissions.com Right on. All right. Anything else from you, Craig, before we sign off? No, I will see you next Sunday. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you later.